Good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are based in the world, and welcome to the second edition of the Future Mobility Day, part of the Smart Mass event series, organized in collaboration with the FIWER, a consensually around successfully proven concept of FIWER Domains Day. Unlike the first event, which was done in German, the official language of this event will be English. My name is Tonya Sapia. I am the Marketing and Project Manager at the Fire Foundation, and I would rather like to thank you all for joining us today. The goal of Smart Mass is to build an open source standardized mobility service platform and the reference architecture that allows for the creation of new innovative mobility services. This includes a new trusted marketplace that allows for interoperability between different as part of the projects the new mobility service are being designed and trialed and well explained in the use case session of this event. The smart Maps platform uses the domain natural power infrastructures and technologies developed as a service oriented generic platform under the EU funding programs. The Purchase Smart Map is part of the technology program Smart Service Belt Second, which is funded by the German Federal Ministries for Economic Affairs and Energy. Now, before we kick start this event, there are a few brief things I would like to mention. With the exception of the speakers, we ask attendees to mute themselves and to turn their cameras off to avoid connectivity issues. Secondly, this event will be recorded and made available on the Fiverr YouTube channel, so you will be able to revisit this event whenever you like. Lastly, should you have any questions for the speaker, then please drop them into the chat. We will then do our best to address as many as possible during the time allocated to the question and answer. Before I pass the floor to the moderator of the day, Olaf Gerd Gemen, and, and also to all the uh, international speakers, uh, experts we have today in the Future Mobility Day, I would like to show a short video uh, related smart mask projects. This is TJ, a 29-year-old industry technician who has just moved to Smart City. Arriving in the city, TJ parks his car in the parking space he has reserved and paid for in advance. Now, he is eager to find out how Smart City will surprise him. The next morning, on his way to work, he receives a notification from the mobility broker provided by Better Mobility about a high level of fine dust. The app offers him a 50% discount on rideshare. What a bargain. A station located in front of his home, he enjoys the city on his way to the car sharing spot. Once there, he sees many Blitz buses around. He has learned that his mobility broker app has just implemented this additional bus service from the smart mass marketplace. Hmm. As he gets into the car, he is already thinking about booking a Flix bus ticket to visit his mother. It does sound like a plan. Mm. Once in the office, while working on an important shipment to the harbour, TJ receives a message informing that a package has been delivered to the nearest packing station since he was not at home. How convenient is that for TJ? Once his first day of work is over, TJ heads out to the packing station. Thinking about his first day at Smart City, TJ is very impressed by how all the smart mobility services that he has used surely have made his life far easier. He can't wait to also experience such concepts in smart industry, smart energy, and smart agri-food. TJ clearly likes smart technologies but he also cares about greener environments for future generations. Therefore, 
he is very happy that he has reduced his own carbon footprint by using ride-sharing offers and public transportation. The next morning, EJ books himself a bus stop with just a click. He is surely making the most of the mobility broker app to explore touristy destinations within the city. The app also offers tickets for a variety of leisure activities. How convenient. While out and about in town, TJ learns that more and more data services that are making such experiences possible are already available on the smart mass marketplace. TJ has always wondered how you can have a quality of life whilst living in overpopulated cities. Now, he has the answer. It is called smart mobility as a service. So, thank you so much, Dunia, for showing us this video stop motion from our Lego Lego world, which we have built in the in the couple of years. Just as a personal note, it was more than four years ago when we applied for funding, and we are very grateful to the uh, thankful to the uh, German minister that they have allowed us to build this wonderful project. Welcome to our future mobility day. So few, um, mobility is all around and actually um, in the next 10 years, so, so to say, um, the mobility cases will disrupt. And when you're looking 5,000 years ago when the, the wheel potentially was invented, the next 10 years will bring a lot of innovation. We see, we'll see new fuels, we will see autonomous cars and even perhaps flying taxis as we have seen in Dubai and, and other areas. And uh, everything is also about digitization. And um, this combination of physical assets, which uh, um, and the, the means of transport and the digital um, possibility to book them, to handle the different means of transport is called mobility as a service. And um, we will see today in, in this wonderful lineup of speakers, a different perspectives on, on this topic. So mobility, uh, we will see uh, what is about interoperability, uh, how we can use physical assets, uh, what is about trains, how connect micromobility to this. We will also perhaps hear uh, from the commission, DG Connect, about the Gaia X project and their aims uh, for the mobility data space, and so on and so forth. And uh, also we will have uh, from, uh, I think, more than 9,500 kilometers from my place away, there's uh, um, in California, we will have an update from the Silicon Valley as well where a lot of these uh, future mobility uh, things happen in, in the last years. And um, so to say, we have uh, two and a half hours in front of us, uh, which are inspiring. And uh, you have the possibility to use the chat, as Tony already mentioned, make the best out of it. So ask, ask your questions, we will follow up, connect to the others uh, and using um, this, this afternoon or this morning when you are on the other side of the world, um, to get some insights uh, about this. This project, as, as also mentioned, is funded by the German minister, but we have a clear global aim. So we really want to come uh, with technology which is freely available, open source, and tackle in the Smart Smart project, we tackle one of the, the key issues, which is interoperability. And from uh, uh, Gernot, uh, who is uh, working uh, along uh, many years on this, we will hear uh, what and how is our vision about interoperability in smart mass. So without not further delay, I would like to introduce um, Svetoslav from DG Connect from the European Commission uh, to share his screen. And uh, we are excited to hear the view from the European Commission on mobility. Welcome Svetoslav. Okay. Um, so when we talk about smart mobility, in order to achieve it, we see it as connected mobility. And when we talk about connected, it happens in different layers. And when I say connected, I'm also referring to the interoperability that was mentioned already. So first, on the physical layer, pure connectivity, then we see it and we do efforts to achieve it in different, with different types of technologies, but most, mostly in 5G. And I'll show what activities we do in the next framework program. Uh, then on top of this, once we have this connectivity, 
we see uh, the Internet of Things connecting, really collecting all the data, processing it and exposing it to developers, to applications, to services via platforms. And we have been working very, very hard to develop these platforms, reference architectures and so on. And again, this is very much in the heart of today's discussion. Uh, I'll go, go more into details in this. And then on top of that, once we have all this, uh, come the artificial intelligence with via services, uh, applications, etc. And it uses the data spaces, the European common data spaces. But they, they, they will be different data spaces, but what we're working towards the European common data spaces. If we if we look at how concretely we have we are um, preparing for this in the next framework financial program. Uh, for the within the connected Europe facility, for example, too, we are we are going to deploy or we are going to to support the deployment of cross-border 5G corridors on the major transport parts, and this is mostly how we de develop different transport services for passengers and good transport, and mostly focused on connected automated mobility and so on. But of course, also supporting things such as the mobility as a service as part of it and so on. Once we have the connectivity, then the services and everything will come of, of any kind. Uh, there is also support for uh, 5G deployment for communities. This will influence the transport mobility part as well, because the connectivity will be there in some communities that are not so well connected and will not be able to afford such connectivity. So. That's yet another support for, for, for our vision for digitalization and new services. And there is also the, the operational digital platforms, which are something in between. It's, an, it's a new thing within the digital part of the, of the set two, which, which is nevertheless focused on energy and mobility. And the idea is that we digitalize some some infrastructure, some some mobility and energy, transport and energy infrastructure that was laid down, but it was not digitalized. So this will end on top of this for certain services. Deployment again, cross-border deployment of, of services. Similar to the 5G above, but but one layer above it's about the platforms. It's about the Internet of Things layer. If we look into the the Digital Europe program. Now, Digital Europe program is a new program. I'll go afterwards to the Horizon Europe, which is the continuation of Horizon 2020 research innovation. But the Digital Europe program is about deployment and building capacity. It's really one step ahead in the process. Now, one step after, so, so to say, in the process of, of technological development and deployment. Uh, so it takes the results from the Horizon programs, from research innovation, and puts them into, into practice, into real uh, deployments. I've taken out, it, it, it's a big thing, I'm not going to present the whole program, I've taken out some things which I know well and which are relevant for discussion today, and that's why I've taken them out, but, but it contains more than this. Uh, so there are a number of European common data spaces that I mentioned that will be deployed under this program. I've Cherry picked only the ones that I think are relevant today for discussion. That's the mobility data space and the Green Deal data space, which will be covering the smart communities data space. And smart communities, again, is something about linking all these different sectors, such as mobility, energy, and so on. Then we are going to deploy urban digital platforms. Similar situation, this will be the platforms that will be connecting the different sectors and multiplying the number of services via standardized interfaces, standardized platforms, and so on. We think that the big role in the future will be played by the urban digital twins. Uh, so that's why we're also focusing on this in this program, because this will be very important to, to manage the, the mobility flows within, within the city, within a community. Uh, and of course, taking into account all the other areas, because it's an urban twin, so it will contain also buildings, weather if you want, uh, water and, and energy and so on. And then we'll be able to, to, to optimize also the mobility as a service or mobility in general transport. 
there will be an AI testing experimentation facilities, which are also very much in the part. There are several several types of them. One is for smart communities, and again, it's very much focused on mobility, energy, and environment. And there will be large scale pilots to prove all this, uh, to test proof all these data spaces, platforms, streams, etc. Uh, it was mentioned about Gaia X within Digital Year program. We have foreseen, we, we got inspired from Gaia X, but we are building within the, the, the Digital Year program a similar model, which probably could be incorporated together with Gaia, Gaia X, is still to be seen, but it's a similar model of pan European federated cloud. And of course, it will support all these different platforms and then other, all these different application areas, such as transport, energy, and so on, will be supported on this model. Uh, if we go into Horizon Europe, uh, there, there are the, as, as in the previous program, so the research innovation, there are the, again intervention areas on smart cities, which has a big part on it on mobility, and then an intervention areas really focused on mobility. Now, this, these areas are written, the, the last one, for example, is written by my colleagues from uh, Digimove. So I'm not super familiar with them, but but they are, there is a lot of budget for seeing for this as well and, and calls, et cetera. And there is this new instrument, which is the mission on climate neutral and smart cities, uh, which is not a typical project or anything. It's a whole kind of, um, how should I say it? It's an integrated concept of how climate neutral and smart cities should be addressed by the commission. Of course, it sits within Horizon Europe and it's cross cross uh, topical so it covers the different areas the different strengths trends uh, and at the same time it's trying to go further so so there is a, a board of, of experts of uh, 15 experts plus 30 more that are supporting them uh, that is developing the strategy that they they have already some some documents published the work is ongoing how how this will be achieved, but they're aiming at achieving 100 climate neutral cities uh, within the next years. And they will see how to do it. One, one part of it will be using the Horizon Europe funds, uh, which are taxed from the rest of the, the topics. And for the moment, the intervention of smart cities is kind of moving, it's still to be seen how it is going to happen, but it will be probably covered by this mission as well. So there are a number of projects of calls that were prepared already for this intervention area, and probably they will be taken over by the mission. This is to be seen. Uh, and, and then there is more, I mean, I cannot cover everything that is about mobility because there is also a digital chapter in Horizon Europe, digital cluster, um, it's not cluster, it's um, anyway, it's, it, yeah, it's cluster probably. Uh, that that is that is also all the application areas we need with many calls etc are, are also of course linked one way or another many in many of the cases with mobility and so on but i cannot go that i cannot mention the whole program or describe it then um there are a number of large-scale pilots that happened in horizon 2030 or still ongoing that i was that I was following, that I was the project officer of or, or, or informed by the, the agencies that is running it for us, etc. But just so on, I wanted to, to mention them. So we had a number of Internet of Things large, large scale pilots, and uh, one was focused on mobility. This was the I2Pilot uh, project, and uh, it, it, it was working like all the other. IoT large scale pilots into developing platforms, reference architectures, uh, putting them into practice, testing them, and so on. Of course, trying to align with all the other areas apart from mobility. Um, they were working with a number of platforms, one end to end fireware, IBM Watson, and others. They were using, in many of the cases, if not most, the NGSILD as a linking component to, to the services layer and so on. And in this service layer, they were using artificial intelligence and machine learning in order to achieve autonomous driving, parking, and in other, in other areas, masks to some extent, and so on. 
Uh, then there was a sister project of it, which was focused on smart cities, but it was very much uh, focused on mobility, uh, which was synchronicity. And there they worked into developing the so-called minimum interoperability mechanisms, which were incorporated again, NGS, ILB, Sarah for Auto, as ontology and, and other principles in order to kind of um, make the solution of the cities independent of the interoperability. So using the minimum set of interoperability components in order to achieve this interoperability without imposing too much on the cities. And this was led to a great extent by the Open and Agile Smart Cities, which is a big city network. Uh, the two projects were working together on many use cases and kind of uh, cross testing. So their solutions are, are compatible. Uh, there was there were in Horizon 2020 yearly smart city lighthouse projects, which in total exceeded half a billion or something of funding. Uh, in which if each of these projects was like 25 million, and they were focused on again mobility, energy, and digital in smart cities, different solutions. There are many cities that were involved, 140 or something. So I'm not going to go into all the things that they tested, but this is another example where mobility solutions, digitalized mobility solutions, et cetera, were, were piloted. And I'm just mentioning this AI for cities uh, because it, I'm the project officer of it, even though it's, it's, it's 6 million, so it's smaller than the previous ones. And it's focused on pre-commercial procurement. So developing AI solutions for the mobility energy area with the goal of achieving sustainability. So if you're not familiar with the pre-commercial pre procurement instrument, it is about uh, paying to companies to develop and kind of taking a big set of, of companies and decreasing it at each stage and going further into development of a product to bring it to market. And eventually, of course, the, the one that reaches the end is the one that the, the group of buyers buys there, like five or six cities that will be buying with many other supporters. Uh, during Horizon 2020, the main instrument used, policy instrument by the Commission to address Smart City was the European Innovation Partnership for Smart Cities and Communities, which had like 5,000 partners approximately. Um, six action clusters worked during these years, and there was, of course, a cluster on mobility, on energy, on integrated infrastructure, which was mainly about digital, and then there was planning, citizen involvement, and so on. Um, they developed a lot of deliverables and, and standards, uh, guidelines, and so on. Um, and yeah, as I said, it was spearheading the work during Horizon 2020. And it was now when we're passing into the new period, it's rebranded at Smart Cities Marketplace. It's refocused and it's mainly now focusing on putting the cities, the, the, the demand side, so cities or other customers, together with the supply side and together with the, with finance in order to uh, to make it happen to to make deals and to 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 accelerate the deployment of smart city solutions that were already developed and piloted as i said they need to get to market um, and finally uh, the digital activities that were developed under this partnership were taken out uh, to, to see how this results and this partnership and also synchronicity projects and so on to see how these results now can be taken to, to market and to address all the different uh, aspects of taking them to, to market. Um, so it's on one side is technical and the technical part there is there is a document a consolidated report that is again based on the work within the European Innovation Partnership of smart cities and communities on the synchronicity project and on other on other activities like when it's concerning governments that it's referring to the EIF and so on etc cetera, etc cetera. the OGC is mentioned and, and so on and so on so so there is a document summarizing all this, and uh, and then there is the financial, legal, education, measuring, and so on. Uh, 
technologies are the key enablers, but of course there are other things to be addressed and we have to, to take into account the citizen, the cities, um, and then use technologies to address and to solve the problems of the cities, the environment, the climate. And of course, uh, but there are more than 80 signatory cities and uh, 40 supporters with some big companies among. And also in the European Innovation Partnership, also big companies develop these documents, such as you know, SAP, Microsoft, and similar. Um, I think these are the things that I wanted to say. But uh, what is important is that that the future of mobility is digitalized, which means it's connected. It's standardized. We think standards are very important. That's why we have worked and we have developed a lot of standards or motivated the stakeholders, put them around the table to develop standards. They have to be trustworthy because otherwise they will not be used. Um, and interoperable. Uh, I think these are some of the things that I wanted to say. Today. Thanks. We could not hear you, Olaf. I have muted myself, which was correct, of course. Yeah, thank you so much, Svetoslav, for your insights on what was going on and what we are looking for, because Horizon Europe is uh, just uh, at the corner. So it, we are just all excited and have hope to, to see this over Christmas to digest it and see uh, what it's available on funding and also to, to find new consortiums, new collaborations to, to bring these policies forward. And as we know, it's everything is related to Green Deal, energy, mobility, digitization. So this is all, are all the topics uh, we are already talking today. And um, yeah, we are really hoping that end, end of uh, January, uh, we will have uh, an agreed budget and then we can restart and continue all these nice projects, which you already mentioned about the Open and Agile Smart Initiative, and also uh, the CHEF program and all the other things, which are so instrumental uh, to achieve interoperability. Wonderful, thank you for that. Um, I would uh, uh, now ask uh, Mario to prepare himself. Uh, uh, Mario is uh, an entrepreneur and a speaker and an author and uh, actually uh, it's very in the morning at, at his place he's uh, uh, broadcasting from california and um, i can really recommend just uh, to say this in, in front to uh, get this newsletter so every every month i really appreciate your newsletter with all the insights around mobility and i'm very excited to see what you have uh, on the table for us today and uh, thanks for, for being here. Uh, thank you very much, Olaf, for introducing me. Yes, I'm in the Silicon Valley in California. For me, it's currently 7.33 in the morning. Uh, sun just rose. Uh, I'm in the Silicon Valley, which is the area between San Francisco and San Jose. So San Francisco, San Jose in the south. I'm about eight minutes uh, south of the Tesla factory. <laughs> I am three and a half hours south of the place where the uh, film Bonanza, the, the TV Western show from the 60s and 70s. So I have my cowboy hat here in order to give you some feeling of the wild, wild west. And I wanted to give you an introduction to what's happening here in uh, this space that is known for companies such as Apple and Netflix and Uber and Google. They are all here. Tesla, a lot of automotive companies at the moment. And uh, just let's dive in into a small presentation of what I'm seeing here and what may be interesting also across the world. So let's, before we talk about the future, let's talk a little bit about the, the, the past. In uh, four years ago, in my home country of Austria, uh, we commemorated the, the 100 year death of uh, our last emperor. And I, you know, the one who was married to Sissy, if you remember those movies, those tear jerking movies. And I went to the summer palace in Schönbrunn and visited the imperial carriage collection. So they have a carriage collection with uh, the old horse carriages, coaches, and cars. And I was standing in front of that very carriage. And that was basically the Porsche of its time. Luxurious, elegant, 
sporty and the emperor didn't just sit uh, passively in there, no, he sat in front and conducted and steered the, the vehicle. Uh, and then I looked at the name of that uh, carriage maker and that was Karl Marius. And I've never heard of this guy. And uh, uh, you probably also never heard about him. And uh, but, but back 100 years ago, he was very well known in the space because he was the coach maker of the emperor. And I was wondering, how come that we're not knowing up any more about that that household name hundred years ago? Uh, and when you look at that, uh, of course, something else happened. Uh, coaches were replaced by automotive by automobiles. And uh, today, of course, we have those innovators and uh, the names of those carrying uh, on their cars, like Carl Benz, Henry Ford, Johann Puch, Gottlieb. Gottlieb Daimler, Ferdinand Porsche. And uh, when you look at the professions or the backgrounds that they're coming from, you see that they are all mechanical engineers, mechanics, metal workers, industrialists, electricians, clerks. But obviously, we are missing a lot of other professions that were common in the coach making industry. There are no stable owners, there are no veterinarians, there are no horse breeders, there are no coach makers in there. And that is an indication that uh, typically nobody or only few companies and people from an industry that is getting disrupted make it into the new industry and new technology because suddenly completely new um, skills are necessary in order to advance that, that, that field. And while in the past it was necessary to know about horses yeah, and build lightweight coaches, now it became more important to bend metals precisely, to build, to, to drill exact holes into metal blocks. Do you know about electricity in order to spark fuels so that they explode and you know operate in a combustion engine? Just to remember that, uh, that is a sign of disruption if you have people coming from a different industry into yours. Now, let's look at the road to electric robotaxis. And that is basically what we're talking as a new disruption 100 years after the coaches were replaced by autos. And that is when we look at that, uh, Silicon Valley is at the forefront of that. This is a list of about five dozen companies that have today in California a license to operate and test autonomous vehicles on all public roads. We have about 800 cars driving around in California, about 1400 cars in the US overall, because 25, 28 other states have similar regulations that allow uh, test permits for such autonomous cars. Now we know of course companies such as Bosch and, and Mercedes and Volkswagen, but there are quite a number of companies that you may have never heard of, like such as Jingji Corporation or Wrightsell or Zooks. Zooks you may have heard because they were just recently acquired by Amazon for $1.2 billion. Now the way they operate is they can run their test cars on all public roads uh, that means all of California and California is large, it's larger than uh, surface wise than Germany, for example, with half the population on that. Um, but also five of these companies are allowed to drive those cars without having a person on board, without having a safety driver on board. And let's take a look at how those cars look like. So here's a video of a collection of encounters that I keep having with those cars. And I have thousands of those little video clips, so I cut them together. This is Waymo, a Google daughter company that uh, uh, operates about 800 cars in the US in total. You see Drive AI, another company bought by, by Apple. And you see, there's so, so many of those driving that they encounter each other. What you see sticking out typically are the sensors like lidars, laser detection systems, like radar, like like uh, ultrasound cameras that you see, and a variety of things that they're they're trying out. Here's one car that didn't even have a, dry, a, a steering wheel in there. Here's a friend of mine waving at his colleagues because he was working at this company, and his his car stopped uh, because it interpreted his hand gesture as a stop signal. Uh, and cars need to recognize that. This is. An old car that Uber had, you see this spinning part on top, that's a LiDAR. Those versions 
back then cost about seventy thousand dollars there are also half a dozen companies that make self-driving trucks here's one auto that was acquired by uber i couldn't make a much better video because i had to drive myself right uh, here is a, a waymo truck uh, as you can see oh, here comes now an embark truck uh, founded by 23 year old so that's that's how you see how you quickly become an underachiever if you live in silicon valley <laughs> uh, if 23 year olds are raising millions of dollars uh, so i can you can watch those for hours those videos the thing is these are very visible cars they're there they're not just running on a test track they're really running in the public this car for example was one of the first apple cars that i've seen uh, it was unknown that this is apple uh, here's a, another version of how Apple then looked like with all these sensor arrangements that they have. And the recent version looks more like an iPad on a roof. And that's also um, Apple here. Now let's take a look at uh, the people behind those changes. Uh, and we see here Elon Musk, uh, the CEO of Tesla, who is a physicist. This is his profession, basically. That's his education. We have Sergey Brin, Larry Page from Google, who computer scientists. We have Kyle Vogt, uh, Cruise Automation, which was acquired by General Motors for a billion dollars. He's a roboticist. The godfather of self-driving, of the modern self-driving wave, is Sebastian Schon, a German who was professor for artificial intelligence at the Stanford AI lab. He's a computer scientist, and then you see AI experts, computer scientists, everything. So what is it what you don't see here? You don't see any automotive guys, right? The old people that you would normally have, like mechanics and, and, and uh, electricians and uh, metal workers, right? So this is an indication that there is disruption going on. Because now with autonomous driving, we have a very different thing happening. It becomes a digital thing. It's not so important anymore to bend the metals and have the measure gaps precisely. What becomes more important is the data that you generate through those uh, sensors, throw them into a machine learning system and train the algorithms on driving ever more perfectly and being able to handle more and more situations better. I give you an example of uh, Waymo. Waymo started about two years ago to drive cars in the Phoenix area without a driver in the public. So here you see this is a collection of videos that are gathered from the internet from, from people living in Phoenix. I have not had the chance yet. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is an impression of what's going on there. This is here, for example, a car now navigating around an accident scene with police uh, uh, conducting the traffic and it is able to handle such a situation so so that that you have to imagine of how far we are here so these are the videos that we see um and and fine and just a few weeks ago tesla uh, you may have heard about the tesla autopilot and those kind of things tesla has started to upload on first customer cars Tesla full serving, full self-driving beta version. That means you may have heard about autopilot. Uh, that's basically a, a driver assist system. Yeah. Uh, but now with the new software that is coming out, and it's supposed Elon Musk said that a few days ago, uh, next year, 2021, will be uh, uploaded through over the air updates on all uh, Tesla cars that have the hardware to run it. And suddenly, uh, 1.2 million cars that today have the hardware on there and any customer hands would be able to drive fully self-driving uh, on every street that those cars are operating. You see already, we've seen already in the last weeks, the updates on the self-driving car feature here, the full self-driving technology, Teslas. Uh, as they are using their customers also for machine learning purposes. So they're downloading the data, putting it in a machine learning system at Tesla, download, downloading that on the cars back again. And the cars uh, incrementally become better and better and better, knowing and being able to handle more situations. Now, one thing to point out, uh, we're all talking about connectivity and the things like that. And uh, if you've ever been to the US, you know, the Streets are not really, the roads are not really the best maintained and the street infrastructure is pretty bad in many places. 
Uh, so there is no connectivity. We don't have 5G. We don't have any sensors in the in the streets. There's not really a standard on out of how to use that. So all these cars are being developed without relying on connectivity. Uh, what they're doing is they are driving around with their cars to make high definition maps of the roads. Uh, Tesla. On the other hand, is not even doing that. They are trying to basically build the maps on the fly by driving around. So we see already a lot of progress here and maybe a very different approach uh, than European uh, automotive suppliers or, and car makers think that autonomous driving works. Um, in uh, a few weeks ago, actually, uh, uh, Waymo started the first commercial robot taxi service without drivers in Phoenix. So since then, it's open to the public. You can go there, download the app, and order such a car and drive around. And now, yes, today, today, uh, actually in Shenzhen, in uh, uh, this is the neighbor city of Hong Kong, uh, AutoX, another startup that has such a license also in California, started its complete driverless autonomous fleet operation for test purposes with about 25 cars in Shenzhen. So you see suddenly empty cars driving around on public streets in cities across the world. And uh, we expect that next year in San Francisco uh, with Waymo. Uh, so probably about in two or three years, we have in the US about 25 to 50 cities where our driverless uh, robot taxi uh, the services are uh, being operating and probably about in two to three, four years, we see then probably, I guess, the first city in Europe with one of those fleets like Waymo uh, coming in there and driving our robot taxi services. Um, just to give you an idea of the disconnect and the, 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 the gap in technology development to traditional car makers. Mercedes, for example, and Bosch announced just a few weeks ago uh, very proudly a service that they have, namely that their cars can park automatically. So if you're driving Stuttgart in one garage in Stuttgart at the airport that has to have sensors, then it can take your Mercedes S-Class equipped with the technology, get out in the garage of the car, press a button, and the car is, is directed by the garage to an empty parking spot. Well, that's a cool feature if it were 2020, if you were talking about the year 2000. But in 2020, I would expect that the car brings me to the airport terminal, drops me off there and then goes home. Yeah, and not have me go actually to the garage and let me drop off, be, have me drop off there and then find the parking spot. So, so we see here a gap of at least five to seven years of traditional car makers such as uh, Mercedes or, or BMW or Volkswagen, just to talk about the German car makers, that the same is true for every other car, our traditional car maker, with the, with the exception of maybe General Motors, uh, to those leading companies such as Waymo. Um, now, that's enough about autonomous cars. Let's talk about electric cars. I told you already, I live eight minutes south of the Tesla factory. We have two Teslas at home. Uh, we are all trying all these, these features and functions that they have. But when we look back at combustion engine cars, we can talk about uh, about 1,200 components that such a V8 engine has. If you add then a transmission and exhaust pipe system and the fuel tank system, you're coming to about 2,000 components. Now, when you look now at an electric motor, such as a Tesla or a Lucid Air, then what you see is that there are about 200 pieces that make the engine, they make the electric motors, uh, of which only few are actually moving. The, the, the majority is just, just screws and parts that, that are not moving at all. And they're much, much more compact. So we talk here about 2,000 versus 200 components, which means that uh, gives you an indication of what it means for jobs. Uh, for every component and every part that we have in such a combustion engine car, there are engineers who design that, engineers who test that, quality assurance, right documentation, a mechanic who has to fix it in the workshop, etc. And now we have the stuff that is far less, requires far less maintenance, there's no oil change, there's no oil filter, there's no spark plug anymore, yeah? it's much more reliable. For example, i give you an, uh, um, just, just a hint of, of what it is, I have my Tesla now for one and a half years, 
I've never been to a service. Uh, there's no service. What is there? There's, I need to change tires. I need to refill the windshield wiper water. I need to, the windshield wipers maybe replace them. That's it. There's no oil to change, no oil filter, etc. So, so it's much more, <laughs> the business is going away for all these dealerships and, and mechanics who are relying on those kind of services. Um, we see also this uh, exponential increase of um, car sales. And uh, while it goes slowly at the beginning, and the guess don't often then goes very, very quickly. And we see those are the recent numbers from Shadista about uh, new uh, um, registrations of electric battery, electric vehicles in Germany. We see almost a doubling every year, every 12 months here. And uh, the 2020 numbers, of course, are still the numbers that are, I think, October. So we're missing November and December uh, still. So, so you see doubling of that. That uh, means today we have about 8% of new registered cars in Germany are battery electric. Last year it was 4%. The year before it was about uh, 2%. So you can imagine if you now have a doubling rate of 12 months that next year we have then 16%. In 2022, we have then 32%. And in 2023, we have more than half of newly registered cars will be battery electric in Germany. Uh, so and if you are in that field of selling components and building components and for combustion engine cars or maintaining them, your business is disappearing. So you have to come up with a backup plan of what you do. So the future of the combustion engine car is the one that the dinosaurs went, they went extinct basically. Um, what, other, what other things can I say about that, about the disruptions? We quickly talked about jobs. So in total, we expect one third of the jobs in the automotive industry with the move from uh, uh, combustion engine cars to electric cars to disappear. We've seen a sign already for that this year, about 100,000 jobs were lost in the automotive industry. Uh, that means full-time equivalent uh, employees. And uh, uh, add to that contractors, we had already probably about alone in Germany, 200,000 people that moved out or had to move out of the automotive industry. And then I calculated worldwide and you see a large pattern of what's going on here. So I just put out there with ICE means actually internal combustion engines. So this is the positive scenario. What you see here, let's give, make, make an example. Volkswagen has about 600, over 600,000 employees. So one third of them uh, in the combustion engine space, 90% of them we don't need anymore, means about 200,000 people that we lay, have to lay off or get rid of. Um, and that is the positive scenario. That means if Volkswagen is able to switch from 10 million cars that they build every year from 10 million internal combustion engine cars to 10 million electric cars. Only then uh, they would have holding those those numbers, and it's not not a given. Um, typically, uh, after disruption, 50 to 90 percent of the companies that were the incumbents in an industry disappear after disruption. Clayton Christensen, the, who wrote The Innovator's Dilemma, who coined the term disruptive innovation, he figured it out for tons of industries. He looked at multiple industries and saw this pattern happening every time. So it is more likely in the automotive industry that we see car maker suppliers disappear than survive. Yeah? And, and here, of course, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a, a future fortune teller. I cannot say who will be surviving or not, but what I typically do, I put uh, a cross uh, um, on those core companies that I'm visiting or having you know, talks to uh, for inspirational purposes yeah, so that they get their shit together, so to speak. So to speak. Um, and uh, uh, we will be very likely seeing quite some shifts in the next coming years happening. Uh, you may have followed the, the market share yeah, and the, and the um, market capitalization of this company, Tesla, is now the most valuable company by far. It basically has, uh, is worth more than the next eight or nine companies together, taken together. Uh, and that with only like a 20th of the cars produced than, for example, Volkswagen. But something very different is happening here. That's a company for the future because they can start monetizing on the data services and autonomous driving. So instead of one cent per mile that a car drives, 
that typically a car manufacturer earns for the lifetime of a car, one cent per mile. Uh, somebody like Tesla using additional services, offering additional services like on an iPhone, like the self-driving cars, uh, can make 20 to 30 cents per mile for the cars that they manufacture. And that is a very different perspective on revenue potential that those companies have. Um, what other changes would we see, for example, for smart cities? Who needs traffic lights? Humans, yeah, uh, because this is how we talk to each other, how we, how we give uh, the way of right for cars and pedestrians. Uh, autonomous cars could negotiate that by themselves like, like ships are doing that today. So we don't need traffic signs, we don't need traffic lights anymore. And don't forget that's a huge business. Alone in Germany, we have 20 million traffic signs. Each one costs 90, 90 euros, uh, plus installation costs of about 100, 200 euro. Uh, that's a big business. A traffic light like this one costs about 35,000 to 250,000 euro. And there are alone in Germany, three million of them. And if the communities and the road uh, administrators can save on that money, that would be a great story for them too. Uh, parking garages, uh, about 95% uh, of all cars uh, are parked at the moment. <laughs> uh, only 5% are driving around. So in Germany, for example, a car is parked 23 hours and 22 minutes every day. On average, it drives not more than 38 minutes. And we need huge space for that uh, to, to be put there. Now imagine we can get rid of garages. It's much cheaper to build apartments. Uh, we, we probably save between 15 to 25% of the prices of apartments. We don't, we can use the streets in very different ways and so on. So there will be a lot of opportunities and chances for cities to use new spaces once we move to a robo taxi service that needs only 10 to 15% of the cars that we have on the streets today. Uh, and maybe a very different story, uh, companies such as Tesla moving also into spaces that uh, are very different, uh, like, like car insurance. I have a Tesla insurance and I pay 20% less than I paid before with this very same uh, covering coverage. Um, but what Tesla is doing is because they can do over the air updates and data services, they can take a look at the data, the driving data on my car and see if I'm driving uh, risky. If my risk profile is, uh, driving profile is more risky or, or you know, good one. Or if I'm using autopilot a lot, which is a safer way of driving. And this way they can adapt the uh, rate, the insurance rate, according to your driver's profile. And that is something that a traditional insurance cannot do at all, that also a traditional car maker today cannot do because they are not really connected to the car and get this driver's data off. So you see already quite some disruption in industries and, and the potential for revenues for companies such as Tesla by using those new digital technologies that they have. Uh, let's come to the last the three slides. Uh, if you want to learn more, I have two books on that, one in English, one in German. The German is called The Letzte Führerschein, Neulich ist bereits geboren, came out in 2017, still current. Yeah, a lot of these changes have happened in the meantime, but still, we're, we're still waiting for. Uh, the book then came out translated with updates in 2019, about a year ago in English, it's just called The Last Driver's License Holder has already been born. Uh, so get those books if you're interested in more details, a very deep analysis from my perspective with some, some forecasts of in what direction it could go. Or if you want to see the most current updates, I have uh, both books come as websites with an accompanying blog. And that blog uh, is called, according to that, you see the, the, the URLs on the bottom, where I keep uh, updates on what's happening, what's going on, what is the stuff that I see. Also, you can subscribe to a newsletter every few weeks. I have a newsletter coming out so you, you know what's going on, at least from the perspective of me in the Silicon Valley to looking at those things that are happening mostly in the Silicon Valley. And I want to leave you with one quote uh, by Elon Musk, uh, um, Enfant Terrible for the German automotive industry. <laughs> uh, and he said, uh, how can I leave the world better than I found it? And so he says, I'm just trying to think about the future and not be sad. What can you do contribute to leave the world better than they found it? Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to hand back to Olaf and to our next speaker. Thank you so much about these insights, Mario. And um, as we all have seen, um, the future is in front of us. And in the last two or three years, 
uh, California was uh, way ahead of what happens, uh, unfortunately, in Europe, or uh, as you mentioned, the car makers like Volkswagen or whatever, they all will, I, I don't hope that they will disappear, but uh, the wake up call you try to come up with two, in 2017 or also in the years before, where all these delegations visited you in California and tried to learn, uh, I don't know where they are uh, then afterwards, but they have not moved. But now we have seen there, they are starting to move, but of course there is a delay of a couple of years. And when I remember that um, uh, you, you, you quoted Elon Musk, uh, Elon Musk have put all his things in open source. So he was quite open to the world. And this is also related to the, to the picture you, you saw on your last slide. Uh, how you see the, um, that open source frameworks, platforms and so on will, will be the way forward for the whole industry. Uh, what, what is your take on this? Well, we see uh, actually open, a lot of open source initiatives coming up. I mean, uh, Baidu, the uh, internet behemoth from China, has the Apollo uh, operation system for autonomous cars. And that's just one of multiple open source systems for uh, autonomous driving, for example. Yeah? Tesla has opened up the patents so that uh, for charging and, and other key technologies, they open up the patents so that uh, they help accelerate the uh, move from to sustainable energy forms. Um, we are currently, so it is, if you are, if you start up, if you want to start into developing autonomous cars or going into electric car technology, there is now a huge infrastructure available. So you can start much faster into that and have successes with those tools and technologies available than just three years ago. So the, the, until the barrier, the entry barrier became much lower. And uh, we will probably see way, way more coming in there. Uh, and my, my, and because traditional car makers are, you know, very protective about their own stuff and they want to do it themselves and don't want to share, I guess we will not see them participating as much, uh, although there are some initiatives going on, but, uh, we will see a lot of new companies moving into the space and occupying the space. Yeah, thank you so much. As as you know, Fireway is an open source framework, so it's clear that we are quite interested to see how how the collaboration and innovation around open source is evolving, and, um, and not only on software, also on hardware, right? So thank you for that. So our next speaker is uh, already uh, here. It's Bernard uh, from the Innovation Manager RBL company and uh, he, when I read his slides uh, uh, the most <laughs> the interesting topic comes in uh, he will talk about it's the u-turn of car bashing that was uh, great to see so it's it's clear that uh, in the past uh, uh, many talked about uh, public transport and everything have to be modal shifted to transport uh, uh, to, to public uh, transport means however 90 percent of the people are commuting or 85 I think by cars still and uh, so it's out of, uh, also about the beauty of cars and how we can build new ones which are future proof, have a slower or a, a smaller carbon footprint, uh, um, more sustainable uh, and, and so on and so forth. So I'm welcome now, Bernard, and it's your floor and your stage. So, so hello. So hello everybody and uh, a very nice afternoon from my side, yeah. Uh, my name is Bernhard, I'm an innovation manager in AVL uh, I'm uh, at taking care of innovation in AVL's uh, powertrain business unit, yeah? and uh, it's a pleasure to speak to to you uh, today. Uh, well, my uh, talk is uh, entitled today "From Hindsight to Foresight" because I will give you a few examples on what we do with uh, data and uh, data in vehicle data and uh, in data from the infrastructure. Um, uh, in order to optimize the operation of the, the classical car, yeah, uh, the the car is, uh, as we learned today, in quite a, a big transition. And uh, uh, what Olaf Gerd mentioned, uh, uh, he brought it very nice to the point: is the car is also uh, attacked from uh, very many sides, from many sides actually. Uh, there is a so-called, I call it an indisputable indictment actually yeah uh, think of the discussion on the environment yeah uh, cars uh, are, are uh, um, responsible for almost 12 percent of uh, co2 emissions 
uh, there are um, more to uh, 7 million uh, deaths each year attributed to emissions and cars. Uh, about 500,000 people uh, die prematurely on the result of uh, either air quality or fine par particles worldwide. So uh, that is uh, an indisputable indictment towards the car in terms of the environmental impact, but also when it comes to economic claims, just think on some statistics that they come up with features like uh, the vehicle consumes about 10 to 12 percent of the average household uh, budget. Yeah, but if you look on the average time that is uh, used for the vehicle, it's about just five percent. Yeah, uh, and of course, cars have some kind of uh, uh, implications uh, and costs. Think on maintaining the streets and so on that um, um, uh, also uh, uh, contribute to a lot of uh, economic claims and economic uh, uh, losses. So the car actually has been uh, the ethic vectors of uh, many, many communities in the recent past. Yeah, uh, And uh, I like the, uh, the keynote speech from my Austrian fellow very much uh, this morning because uh, this evening, sorry, uh, because uh, uh, this picture here uh, is kind of um, presenting uh, the same thing uh, uh, in a little bit uh, compressed way. So what we have um, in the automotive market that is actually we have a transformation that is provided, that is driven by three pillars. Uh, I always like to talk about the uh, so-called market pool that is actually the, ev the evolution of the customer needs. Uh, so uh, the evolution of customer needs can be characterized in terms of uh, that the customer today uh, needs infotainment. Uh, he, he wants to have infotainment. He wants to have uh, um, professional human machine interaction. Sorry, I did not on switch my cam, which I have done now. Uh, strong need for customization uh, as well as uh, the transition to mobility as a service. But on the other hand, uh, and that was very well illustrated also by the professions uh, um, that we learned about in, a, in this keynote talk today, uh, the, 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 on the other hand, there's a strong technology push. Yeah? Uh, I, for myself, for example, I'm an innovation manager, but by my background, uh, is uh, computer science, and uh, and uh, uh, I have found my ground in the automotive industry. So on the other hand, there is what a term that I would call a technology push yeah? uh, in terms of the new means that are opening uh, new capabilities uh, in through the availability of these technologies, like uh, cyber physical systems, play an enormous role today. Uh, to, but because every bit of information can be digitized. Uh, in the, it has the industrial internet of things, the connectivity of cars, yeah? uh, particularly machine-to-machine -machine communication is playing in a decisive role. Uh, the, the package around data analytics, uh, visualization and artificial intelligence that is pushing to the market in, in the sense that there is a technology push in addition to the application pool uh, that comes from the customer. And the third uh, uh, pillar that is uh, uh, pressing on the automotive market is that there is uh, the need for the reduction of pollution uh, and emissions uh, due to the need to comply with uh, regulations. Uh, there is the societal need to reduce the traffic fatalities, uh, particularly in, in Europe. Uh, we are confronted with an aging population uh, and, uh, and with cities that are growing and growing, causing lots of congestion. So there are societal challenges and uh, compliance and legislative issues that are um, um, coming to the automotive market. And this is uh, bringing um, us to a point where uh, there is a reorganization of the automotive market. Yeah. Uh, and it is debatable whether it's disruptive or it is uh, more incremental. That also depends, I think, from the area where you are looking on, probably in Europe more incremental than in the US and in Asia probably even, uh, even more disruptive. Uh, but uh, this is actually a market transformation that we see. And uh, what came to my mind also when I prepared the talk is that uh, uh, this is actually uh, 
meaning that uh, this market transformation uh, will result in more sharing in less cars. And uh, I think uh, particularly in this year, due to the COVID crisis, we have seen a little bit the grounding of coming back to reality. So uh, what we have seen, for example, out of the statistics is that uh, uh, some cars like the Volkswagen e-Golf or the Renault uh, Zoe, uh, uh, that, that, that the sales have uh, inc uh, have decreased less than uh, for other cars. Yeah, uh, more than 50% of the market are built up by electric and hybrid cars at the moment in Germany. Uh, also, if you compare it to the last year, there are 2.6 times more electric vehicles registered compared to uh, the 2019 period and you have to keep in mind that the sentiment is very negative to the COVID crisis at the moment. Uh, well, there are several aspects to consider. Uh, on the one hand side, you have uh, this government funded purchase incentives uh, in France, Germany, also uh, I think a little bit in Austria uh, to, to contribute to the, to the economic recovery plans. Uh, on the other hand, I think COVID has she also shown one thing that there is a sense of security uh, using private cars. So uh, in the face of the pandemic, uh, social distancing has gained uh, strong, strong importance. And uh, many of the, I looked at the French statistic here, of the um, consumers that are buying to go a car in the next 18 months in France, for example, uh, um, uh, do this because of uh, a car opens an opportunity to do uh, social uh, distancing uh, to to do this yeah so uh, th that is bringing back the car uh, also to the uh, discussion in the public agenda also if you we, we see for example here um, out of the same statistics um, uh, the personal vehicles have seen the smallest decrease since the outbreak of the COVID crisis. Yeah, uh, in particular, public authorities, uh, let's say, are addressed by that as well. Uh, actually, the initial goal uh, that started, uh, I think, almost 30 years ago is to have an easy and carbon-free transport. Um, and uh, uh, what we might probably see in the future uh, is that uh, we are approaching a kind of public-private partnership uh, also for the car. Uh, the public transport infrastructures uh, has already, let's say, um, because of this uh, enormous amount of underinvestments in the last 20 to 30 years suffered from them and combined with the need for social distancing, uh, uh, there is some kind of uh, revival of the car on the one hand side, but on the other hand side, uh, it, it, cars become more and more expensive. There is this market transformation, more and more technology is packed into the car. And, uh, and um, I think the main idea should be not to uh, work against the car, but to work with uh, the car in a more controlled way to achieve this goal, uh, this goal of carbon-free transport uh, uh, in a most uh, in 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 a kind of efficient transport solution, and part of this efficient transport solution is to enable individual mobility. Yeah, and this is let's say uh, some transformation that we have to see and to bring into the discussion uh, of the of the overall discussion uh, into the discussion of how to set up meaningful by private public partnership because the car has here a, a very well defined role and uh, probably as a a model of uh, thought uh, i would like to illustrate here a comparison with the mobile phone so uh, what we learned from mario today uh, uh, he showed this very nice uh, um, um, car where the emperor was uh, was driving with my mine my, my one is not that nice but mine was this, has started in 1908 uh, and you see the involvement of the car probably up to the uh, connected cars that we will see on the near um, on the european market uh, uh, in the near future and probably to future cars and uh, this is an involvement of the car that is comparable to the mobile phone yeah 
uh, the mobile phone also started very clumsy. The mobile first mobile phones uh, were rather limited, and here we have a technological evolution. But what uh, came with this technological evolution is also an evolution of the market organization. Uh, think of the phone that you buy uh, with a contract from a mobile operator today. There are many phones that are tailored of the needs of the uh, different uh, customer segments. Uh, uh, and uh, more important in the phone is the software than the phone on its own. So even the phone is becoming some kind of commodity. Um, and uh, this could be compared to the evolution of the car. And in this context, I think we need to reframe the public-private partnership. Probably in the future, we will see, see cities that are operating some fleets, yeah, uh, and the car is comparable to the mobile phone and uh, customers uh, get some contract uh, in this kind of new market organization and can use different cars in the winter and in the summer, similar um, uh, uh, configurations. Uh, what is, I think, the important point here is that this kind of transformation requires uh, a strong um, transition, uh, a strong movement of capital in the sense that uh, there, need to be, there needs to be a shift from the capital expenditures to uh, the, the operational expenditures. A uh, uh, customer just wants to pay the OPEX actually, uh, but uh, uh, let's say somebody has to do the capital investments and probably a public-private partnership uh, is able to bring here uh, the necessary investments to uh, to enable and to promote this kind of uh, transition that we see here on the market. And what uh, brings me to the point is actually uh, here that uh, I also like to speak a little bit about uh, uh, how we can, let's say, mo make mobility smarter. And we, as in AVL, we are, let's say, in Supporting OEMs and tier ones in their engineering solutions. Uh, we are offering engineering solutions to them. And uh, I briefly will recapitulate on what we do with uh, data in this respect yeah? uh, and how we contribute to making the mobility smarter, uh, as well as uh, a little bit talk about the value proposition that comes with these kinds of, um, uh, of engineering solutions. Uh, I'd like, like to outline a little bit of spectrum uh, from hindsight to foresight. So uh, actually based on the data, data deciding what happened in the car, why did it happen, uh, what will happen in the future, and probably or we can even proactively influence uh, in terms of prescriptive analytics, how can we make some things happen, yeah? One quite obvious thing in this, what one quite uh, obvious thing for the classical car is, is the area of diagnostics. Yeah, uh, Here it is, let's say, the uh, service intervals that uh, is driven by data. So usually you have a fixed interval and you can transition from this fixed interval of services maintenance uh, cycles to a uh, usage-driven uh, service interval. Uh, they are big data plays a strong role. Think of a fleet of cars uh, uh, that uh, um, is operated, yeah. Uh, and uh, in some of the cars, in very few of them, you detect uh, some failures. You have a defect in these cars. So then, what you can do is you can uh, um, correlate these defects with. Uh, data that is coming from the cars, like uh, uh, simple data, that, uh, like kilometers that have been driven every day, the speed, the torque, the usage of the engine, the ambient temperature, and correlate this with the defects. And uh, this gives you uh, the ability to predict uh, future defects for this fleet. Yeah? Uh, of course, there is an engineering step in between. You have to do some feature selection. You have to do some labeling, then machine learning, then use the model, this kind of uh, executable model in order to predict the defects in this fleet. And then uh, by, by bringing this, this to a platform uh, that supports uh, the operation, the fleet manager in, uh, in, in scheduling the service cycles on a usage-driven way, uh, this is, let's say, 
something that uh, is the smartness uh, that comes here to the mobility aspect. Yeah, and of course, this is uh, now an example from the rather traditional car segment. Uh, the more challenging thing today is, of course, when it comes to um, uh, electric fired, electrified cars. We are running a little bit out of time, so I'm I'm so sorry to to say. Um, well, if if you, I'm very quick. I'm just mentioning two uh, use cases. So when it comes to electrified cars, uh, it is uh, you can do, for example, based on the data in the vehicle, adaptive cruise controls, yeah, to dynamically adjust the um, uh, the control of the powertrain uh, to red lights, for example or to uh, make it more energy efficient. And also uh, for electric cars, the battery is a very systemic component. Uh, the battery life cycle management uh, in terms of uh, deciding uh, how to charge the battery to, co to, to prevent the aging of the battery is some of the use cases that we are working on in this direction. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry for having consumed too much time. Bye. Thank you so, so much for your interesting uh, insights about this because you, you're handling this data and this is, uh, as, as we all see, very important. And of course, also the interoperability and, and, and all you get uh, the data uh, to analyze, predict and, and so on. Uh, what I also loved is your idea and you really nailed it down of the public-private partnership because actually it's car bashing or this kind of modal shift is only used to say, okay, we have to all, all we have to use public transport, right? So, but when you look at the efficiency and the capacity of uh, public transport, it's, it's a small amount. So the vast majority of everyone is using a car. And when you can increase the efficiency of the private car uh, and also the, the footprint and so on bringing down, then this 10% change in, in this private car area uh, you have the huge effect which completely compensates any effort you have on the public side. So I think it's really a public-private partnership in the mindset uh, that, that communities mm -hmm. in ecosystems have to work together uh, to bring this new future mobility in the right shape. Thank you for these insights. So our next speaker comes uh, from a, also from Austria, right? So it's a family-based yeah. uh, Austria <laughs> event now. So in, instead of going skiing this year in, the, in, in Austria, we have all this innovation from Austria on board today. And I exactly. welcome Laura as an innovation manager from Swaco. And as you already heard that uh, the, the, the street lights will disappear. <laughs> so what is your take <laughs> on this, Laura? <laughs> yeah, you will find out in the in the next uh, in the upcoming minutes. Uh, thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks also for the uh, organization of this great event and for having us here today. So uh, just a few words about Svarko. So yes, indeed, uh, we uh, come from Austria, but we are also spread worldwide, not only with our offices, but also with our solutions that are present in more than 70 countries. And what we do, actually, so we were talking about uh, how uh, mobility uh, is evolving and we were talking about cars. Uh, but now what's on the other side? What is on the infrastructure side? And uh, this is what Svarko does, actually, because uh, it's since 50 years that we manage road transportation. We started with an innovation back then with producing glass beads that uh, are uh, introduced in the road marking systems in order to increase reflectivity. And starting from then, uh, the group uh, um, grew a lot. And now we have two divisions in Svarko, one dealing with road marking systems, one dealing with ITS. And in the ITS division, we really cover and lots of aspects of mobility because we uh, provide solutions for urban and extra urban traffic management, public transport management, uh, e-mobility and parking. And uh, yeah, we saw the carriages in the in the uh, presentations before and uh, uh, it's uh, yeah, interesting how we all start uh, started from the past and from our origins. So uh, yes, on one side we were having the carriages, but on the other side, uh, yeah, actually hundred years ago, uh, we had the first uh, electrified uh, traffic light. And it's interesting to see also how uh, traffic uh, management has 
evolved since then. Because uh, traffic management then was about systems, about devices, about a device that was a, able to switch three colors, red, amber, green. And now we learn that managing mobility and managing traffic is more than having a device that is changing colors. Why? Because um, of the trends that we are living, all of us, so uh, due to urbanization, due to what we saw in the presentations before, uh, the uh, upcoming autonomous vehicles all around, then due to connectivity and IoT, uh, due to the fact that we need to think more about the impact of mobility on the environment, so all cities, everybody's investing in sustainable mobility due to the fact that we want to enable uh, the modal shift uh, and also to make a different usage of, of the vehicle or a more intelligent and shared and sustainable usage of the vehicle because we have we are we have this enormous amount of data and I really like the point of view uh, of the AVL with the descriptive, uh, predictive, prescriptive uh, approach for, for data in order to extract value out of data and also the upcoming electric vehicles. But how do we see this? So I, I like the question and actually uh, the answer at a glance uh, is in this slide. So we see all these trends uh, as opportunities uh, for us, for traffic industry. And how is that? Uh, given the fact that uh, there is indeed the growing urbanization, this means that uh, there is business for us still in the urban sector because we need to come up with new traffic management offerings that in order to address not only vehicles but all transportation modes and congestion uh, of course then if you think about autonomous driving we believe that yes indeed we know that uh, especially in california there are lots of uh, autonomous vehicles already um, going around but we believe that uh, in our future cities uh, at network level we will still need an orchestrator and this is how we see the future of traffic management with regards to, uh, to connectivity and uh, and iot we believe that the connected traveler and you will see in my next slides it's really the key points where the traffic management is transforming from traditional to collaborative then, of course, for sustainability, we need to come up with solutions where we don't look at traffic in a vertical way, but we look uh, at it in a cross-domain environment where we put together health and transportation uh, in order to, to make sure that our cities are more livable. Uh, the same, of course, for big data. And uh, as I was saying before, it's about extracting value out of data. So, uh, given the fact that uh, our, our main topic is mobility as a service, uh, my choice for today, for the next few slides, um, was to uh, concentrate on this uh, interaction between traffic management and mobility as a service. So, if we talk about mobility as a service, really everybody has big expectations on this. Since uh, a couple of years ago, when it was really the buzzword uh, at one of the congresses, uh, we started looking uh, more and more into it. And for the traveler, it's really the promise that they will be able to plan and pay for the travel in the easiest way, uh, that it, was, it that mass will bring the cheapest uh, uh, alternative and um, the perfect match. On the other side, also the cities have great expectations because they would like to use mass also as a control uh, let's say, tool to move people away from cars and also to keep the city moving uh, according to their policies. Nevertheless, there are still gaps and limits if we talk about mass. Uh, first of all, mass is still a, a local trend. Interoperability, it was mentioned uh, also at the beginning of our session, is often missing. Then we need indeed to enable a smooth transition from private vehicle ownership to a, a smarter usage of, of cars. Um, and something that is happening when we talk about mobility service providers is that 
often it happens that they don't take into account the collective uh, uh, interests and we need to create an environment where we can balance the individual objectives with the collective objectives. And how can this traffic management, uh, how can uh, traffic management support this? So we started with the traffic light uh, 100 years ago uh, with what we call tra the traffic management 0.0, zero, dot zero where we had standalone systems devices. Then, of course, we talk about the connection where we exchange information, but usually is a one way information like uh, real time traffic information, like floating car data. OK, it's one way information. But what we want to achieve is really a collaborative environment where we insert the traveler in the traffic management loop. And for example, we don't only share the status data, but also the intentions, where I am and where I want to go and when. And on the other side, the traffic management center shares also the intentions, the traffic management plans and strategies at network level. And for example, we are working on this under the Arctic umbrella since uh, really many years. Uh, and the idea behind it's really to create a platform where actors from all the environments can sit together and think on how this collaborative traffic management can actually work at all levels, technical level, legal level, and also from a business point of view. And I'm just happy to share with you the fact that today the platform has uh, over uh, 40 members and it's self-financed work uh, where people really and companies invest their time and resources. Uh, so we believe that uh, indeed traffic management is the invisible actor in the mobility as a service value chain because you cannot have a reliable mobility as a service ecosystem without traffic management, without demand monitoring and forecast, without monitoring the infrastructure, without a good planning of mobility, and of course, without this real-time exchange where you exchange the status, but also the plans in order to achieve equilibrium across the network. And in the closure of my presentation, I just want at a glance to, to tell you how we in Zvarko are also transforming this from concept to real life. Uh, for example, we are dealing with the implementation of the traffic management system in Qatar in view of the world championships. Uh, and here we have lots of challenges, manage congestion, of course, the collaboration at network level and so on. So uh, what we, we are doing there, we are really integrating the more than 40 systems. And this is why it's really a project that demonstrates interoperability uh, with really a very high number of, of devices and um, Yes, let's, let's hope in a great mobility management for the FIFA Cup. Um, so also for us, let's say in this changing uh, world, uh, traffic management is not only providing devices that change colors, red, amber, green, but it's really a mission to improve quality of life, to make cities more li livable, to connect travelers and stakeholders, to support uh, air quality, to integrate micromobility, for example, in the overall traffic management ecosystem, and most of all, to be able to understand the traffic in order to provide the best possible solutions. So that was all from my side uh, for today. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Laura. That was amazing. You really tackled a lot of these important things uh, which are needed. And it's also uh, wonderful to see that during the last 100 years, you are still on the innovation path. And perhaps you remember, it's a couple of years ago, I think six or seven years ago, when uh, Professor Lutz Heuser comes up with the idea of the humble lamppost. And uh, this idea of the humble lamppost really was enlightening all of us how we can reuse the city furniture. And, and, and now you extended this to the data platform in, in a very well way. And the project you mentioned, My Corridor, your colleagues have already introduced me in, into the outputs of the My Corridor project together with Etico. It's really amazing. And 
I, I really hope that we can uh, also link to this when we have our conference in March, where you, of course, will all again invited to, to see our, our last outputs of this project. So thank you so much thank you. for these insights. So, and uh, next speaker is uh, my former colleague, uh, Gernot Böger, who will introduce you in the, the architecture and the rationales behind the Smart Mass project. So what we started uh, a couple of years ago, so it's uh, when, I know uh, Mars is around since five, five and a half years. Mars Alliance started five years ago. So it's a uh, kind of five years anniversary now. And uh, this was a time where we applied for this project and get this funding from, from, from the German minister. And uh, so now we, we hear what is the status about the Mars Mars project since uh, uh, in the couple of years we have uh, built a lot of this technology. And the idea is now for, for Gano to introduce us in, in what is the actual sex. Welcome, Gano. Okay. Thank you, Olaf. Um, nice to be here. I'm happy to be here. And um, yes, Gano Burger, my name, uh, Solution Architect at Fiverr. And uh, I'm talking about partner integration patterns and common standards in our project. And uh, first of all, I want to highlight uh, to the right part of my slide uh, that our project is not. Uh, positioned in the Ministry for Traffic and Transport, but it's uh, positioned in the uh, Ministry for uh, Economy and Energy. And that has a specific reason. And uh, that's also the reason for the uh, participation of Fiverr in this uh, project, because uh, the positioning is about smart mobility in smart cities. And this is more or less a continuation of uh, what we've heard in the presentations before. Uh, that it's not only transport, it's transport in the city. So uh, it's relevant if I have an autonomous car uh, to know about the world around me and the world around the car and what is going on in the, at the next crossing, uh, where big traffic congestions are. So it's about the context, it's about describing the world around us uh, as it is now. Uh, it is projected, um, maybe via artificial intelligence or big data algorithms. And in the end, it's about describing the world around us. And this is one of our major uh, mottos at Fiverr. It's about context information, describing around uh, uh, the world around us. And also mentioned in the presentations before, it's not about smart mobility, but it's uh, about the much different domains that occur in a city that it's about uh, energy, that you have traffic when there is a good energy situation, that you have farming, that you have to transport their goods or their uh, farming machines across roads that might cause congestions. So it's not only traffic, but it's bridging data silos that have been uh, um, yeah, uh, rising in um, different domains. And Fiverr uh, has the aim to cross those data, sil data silos and make smart mobility in smart cities uh, so that we can uh, describe cross-domain use cases uh, smartly implemented in the idea of fiber with the different components that can be assembled together and uh, linked semantically uh, with the concept of linked data and the semantic web that is uh, projected as the future of the web that it's not only information uh, available but inter information interlinked uh, that uh, information sources in the web, for example, or in different systems can link to different sources uh, like Google is doing it, for example, on the web pages. When you describe your um, shop opening hours or your product details and prices that you can then find in search results, for example. So uh, we began in 2018 and we had a workshop in July. And one of the key findings, uh, I only have 10 minutes, so I have to focus, of course, was uh, common interfaces are missing or we are missing, and we heard it before, uh, it's about exchange of data, it's about interoperability. And uh, so we have found out and analyzed in a workshop style that there are um, no real common interfaces available that help to exchange data in mobility and mass uh, applications to help services to work together. So this is the current situation, proprietary interfaces in the mobility market. We have different mass providers, we have different transportation providers, and more or less you have one-to-one -one connections uh, with uh, heterogeneous technologies uh, included. So we have different data formats, XML, JSON, we have data protocols, we have um, 
process these signs. Some of them do multiple steps in a sequence, others do them in one step. We have different master data available. We have different update intervals. Some data is updated every five minutes, every other every one hour or one day. So uh, many, many different uh, technology issues coming together that make it difficult to exchange data and to make data interoperable, interoperable in the mobility market, market. And in the end, this comes up to costly proprietary one-to-one -one integrations. And uh, yeah, this is the current situations or looking back into the past. And of course, the also European Union has notified uh, about it. So there was the order to create national access points that should be available since 2020, providing um, common data exchange formats for transportation data. But as we can see in this over, uh, overview sketch, uh, still it's different, domain, uh, different interfaces uh, for different uh, transportation modes. And um, when we analyze it a little bit more deeper and we talk about scooters in the cities or taxis or car sharing, uh, this move is important and great, but it's complex and it's not fully sufficient today. So uh, that is the reason why we talk about smart mass and uh, we want to help uh, with context standardization so that ideally uh, mass providers have to adopt one time to the marketplace of the uh, mobility data service and transportation providers have to only adapt one time to this uh, marketplace and then they can uh, make it easier to bring services and uh, users and applications that use services together. So uh, what we offer in Fiverr is only one interface. We call it NGSI, Next Generation Service Interface. There is one former version, version two, and the linked data concept that is integrating the linked data uh, schemas. We have uh, shared, data um, um, shared data models for similar services that if you want to integrate bike sharing in Berlin, that you have five or 10 different ones. So Ideally, you only have to integrate one uh, schema and can integrate uh, all of them. Uh, we provide right time data out of the box. Non-mobility data is easy to be mixed in, like weather conditions, like traffic conditions. So it's not only pure mobility, but all data describing the uh, round around you, the world around you. And of course, with the component set that we offer in Fiverr, you can create smart applications that can handle with artificial intelligence, that can handle with big data, complex event processing. Um, that is uh, an advantage for the mass provider. And for the service providers, it's a one-time integration into the marketplace, and then they can offer their services to multiple users uh, here in the Nord. And this opens new cross-domain market opportunities. So uh, that uh, it, if it's on a marketplace, and this is uh, the smart marketplace, as you can see here, um, then it's available for multiple clients, and this opens new market opportunities. So we have created an open source uh, smart mass architecture. I don't go too deep because it's only 10 minutes, but we are using uh, fiber components, open source standard components available. They implement the NGSI interface uh, in uh, the leak data concept, future uh, ready and uh, open for the next uh, future. And uh, we will integrate common integration patterns with common standards and we have added or we will add new components to our uh, component set that will be available after the project to the open so that uh, it is as open source available to be integrated in different services. So uh, last slide, um, if the noise is coming from Olaf, um, we are also evaluating, I talked about data models, we are evaluating um, evaluation of uh, new mass standards. It's about the TOMP standards, it's a transport operators and mobility provider. Uh, it is an international um, inter, uh, in, in, uh, movement uh, to, to also offer um, mass data interchange standards, for example, for taxi services, for bike sharing, for car sharing. So closing the gap uh, between what we have in the EU and what is missing. So we try to integrate them as much as possible in what we offer to be ready for the future. And then uh, in the end, we try to have an open source solution for a mass platform available that can offer um, modular mobility services 
on a marketplace to the public uh, to be used by other mobility providers. So with that, um, this is just the definition. If you uh, want to load down the slides later, um, uh, what about uh, what, the, what is the core meaning of the TOM uh, API? And uh, so this looks upcoming and promising. Um, but it's not yet fully implemented. We are, uh, and the, the, mo the movement the organization is discussing with the policymakers uh, in Europe and worldwide. Uh, with that, I want to thank you for joining us today. So um, this is what we plan to offer after the end of the project. It is uh, end of March this year. And uh, thank you for um, having me. And so I give back to Olaf. Thank you so much, Gernot, for this insight and also this architecture slide. And uh, I'm, it may be that uh, Laura, uh, when, they are, when she's implementing with her team in Qatar, uh, still can make use of this nice interoperability framework, right? So um, as, as, as said, it's open source, it's modular. Uh, it's running and investigating in all the available data schemas uh, and using different protocols to harvest the data and giving one clear interface, NGS ILD. So that's uh, important uh, uh, that uh, we are open to new technologies and even GTFS, which is now by the My Mobility uh, Data Foundation uh, uh, handled and, and many other, Netix you have also mentioned, there are a lot of things going on and uh, it's up to us to, to be open, transparent and, and using uh, the best in class uh, uh, to, to have uh, yeah, to, to facing the barrier of interoperability and also to, to reuse um, the different components and schemas and data models in across Europe and across the world. Um, yeah, thank you, Gernot, uh, for this. So now um, there's, of course, uh, a Q&A session. <clears throat> we, are, we are right in time, so we still have uh, five minutes or so uh, when uh, some questions coming, uh, coming around. And there were uh, or already some, some questions from... from uh, um, from the audience. And uh, the last question comes from Nicola to Gernot. Um, do the public traffic companies deliver their data into the platform too? <laughs> Please, Gernot, tell us uh, the barriers or tell us the truth. Actually, this is referring to what I've shown you with the UU EU initiatives, because uh, it is by law, uh, Maybe it's not 100% implemented so far, but by law that uh, the public transport information must be available, must be made available in national access points since 2020. And uh, in those um, um, data formats I've shown you, so there is Datex and there is NetX, uh, Datex2. And uh, so they are uh, forced by law to provide that data into national access points. And from there you can integrate it. So, uh, basically, for example, for public transport data, it's not GTFS anymore, as is Google standard, but they were changing for, to, to NetX uh, from the European point of view, um, but you can export it also into GTFS. So it's still considered, but they have changed it to the European uh, way of uh, perspective. But yes, uh, so traffic companies must deliver the data into the uh, to, to national access points, and from there we can access it. Okay, so there was another question comes from Lars um, uh, concerning uh, what is about data protection. So should we really know everything about the people just when we try to understand the mode in which he's traveling or when we, when we just uh, want to provide a, a small information? So it's really about uh, uh, data protection, GDPR compliance. So is this a barrier? or uh, how, we, how we tackle this challenge. So who, who, who wants to answer this? Maybe Laura or, or Bernard? Because you are implementing, or Laura, you're yes. implementing. So how, how you yes. Of course, uh, we want to know uh, the valuable information, but we don't need to know it all. Uh, this is one of the challenges also when dealing with a huge amount of data that we have available to extract and to transmit and to share with other actors exactly the relevant information and to extract the value out of data what uh, what i was uh, mentioning in my in my intervention yeah thank you laura probably i can uh 
comment this a little bit also from my side. Uh, of course, this is a challenge, yeah. Uh, GDPR is one example of a, a, a specific challenge, uh, but uh, uh, even if, if it comes to business to business transactions, uh, there are a lot of uh, privacy concerns in data that are a challenge today. And I would uh, like to draw a little bit, a big, bigger picture even on that. Uh, I think there are actually three categories of uh, challenges that we need to work on. And our first uh, keynote speech today uh, from DG Connect uh, illustrated that also quite nicely that there is a need for, uh, I think he mentioned the mobility uh, data space. Yeah, space. Uh, yeah. Actually, the, the mobility mail that is addressing much more than just technological aspects. If you think on the technological aspects on, on, on different platforms, of course, there are many challenges and not everything is solved, uh, uh, but uh, we have uh, major uh, platforms in place and uh, and we can work with these kind of platforms but there come uh, additional challenges in terms of business aspect so where is the value proposition located yeah uh, because without value proposition uh, there will be no sharing of data yeah that is the main driver behind sharing the data and of course there are lots of uh, as a third category uh, legal aspects related to data, uh, the concept of, of ownership of data, uh, and how uh, we deal this in context of the spe specific uh, domain-specific data sharing spaces that we might see in Europe. And I think there's yeah. also quite a big difference uh, if you look at the bigger picture in the geopolitical agenda. Uh, in China, these regulations are completely different than we uh, uh, see the regulations in Europe and probably also are different from the US because in Europe we have last week we have seen this European Data Governance Act. We have European values reflected into this act and I think uh, uh, data sharing is a topic that is uh, uh, coming in the next year that is a very important thing that we need to work on in order to provide solution for our customers. Yeah. Thank you so much on, on this insight. So also you, you, you also talked about the data spaces coming up and there's a, a lot of uh, talks about data sovereignty. So really uh, who is uh, also the My Data initiative is, is very important in, in this respect. And uh, we all are aware and uh, I would say the European way of handle this is well appreciated. And the different policies, and, and they are already in the Gaia X a working group on this, how to align uh, the enforcement of different politi politics and policies. So let's see uh, how the Europeans are dealing with this, maybe different in China, and now we have to say maybe also in Turkey, in, U in the US, in Canada, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And this is all tackled in, in, in this Gaia X project, and we're really all looking forward to, to this and how, how they work with this. Yeah, wonderful. So, um, there's no other question around, so we can go forward. We are right in time. And uh, now we can really jump into a, a specific example. So um, now we will have uh, Benedetta. Benedetta is working for a nice company called FUPS. And FUPS is working on technology, which is uh, in the sector of uh, mobility as a service quite advanced. Uh, already started to integrate this with Fiverr, NGSI data models and interoperability quite a couple of years ago. She's also a gold member of Fireware and she, she contributed to the project many times in the past years and I'm happy to have her here again uh, presenting her solution. Benedetta, it's your floor. So thank you for having me here. Um, as Olaf rightly pointed out, I'm going to introduce you uh, how we developed our mobility as a service solution for the city of Florence and Wolfsburg. So my name is uh, um, Benedetta and I work in FUPS. FUPS, uh, just to show you who we are as an IT company, a small medium enterprise active and, and located in Florence, which core business is, is a smart city to build up a smart mobility platform, a smart city platform and smart industry platform, which are actually based on a similar technology, on the same technology. So who we are, that's that's a little bit, a little resume of our journey together with Fiverr. So we started our Fiverr experience back in 2015 with the first acceleration project called Frontier Cities that gave the light to move uh, what is today uh, known as Move Up, 
which is our mobility as a service uh, uh, platform. From that point onwards, we had the possibility to participate to a second European, uh, European funded uh, acceleration project uh, where we have developed, uh, let's say, a white label microservice platform that is nowadays used in, the, in, in, in four different realms, smart mobility, smart city and smart energy and industry. By the way, if you want to know more about our activity, how we have uh, grown our activity and platform, just go and have a look at, the, at our impact story, uh, which has been published, and I really thank Fiverr for this, on the Fiverr webpage. You can download it or um, also read it online. And now I'm going to move uh, to the core of my presentation, which is um, which is dedicated to tell you a little bit more about our use cases. So that's just to provide you with an overview of our architecture. As you might see here in, a, in, a, in this little pink box, the core of our platform is fiber-based, and at the core there is the SAP context broker and the Signal State Change uh, subscriber, which are two um, fundamental uh, components for the data collections. Um, as you might see, uh, our platform is able to support connectivity with several devices, such as, for example, IoT uh, or, I don't know, user-generated um, data and so on and so forth. And it has two main endpoints. Uh, one dedicated to the generic user, which is a mobile app, and one dedicated to uh, the, let's say, specific operator, what is commonly known as uh, the public administration or the mobility manager. Uh, so our core idea is actually to build up a 360 degrees uh, mo smart mobility um, environment and to let the two-sided of the, the offer and the demand uh, side communicate among each other. So now I'm moving to our experience in Florence. Uh, um, our, uh, we had um, recently de um, deployed in production our uh, mobility as a service platform, which is called IFA, Info Mobility Florence. Uh, as I told you before, it has two main endpoints, a mobile app and a web app. And here in, in this in this slide, you might see the home page of um, the mobile app. So the, our core intention is really to create a 360 degrees mobility as a service environment that can collect, uh, that can connect both uh, the end user and uh, the um, public administration. So the prominent advantages to use this kind of platform is to, for, for, the, for the, let's say, mobility manager is to monitor the status of urban mobility in real time uh, and check if there are some uh, crisis areas and of course intervene in case of crisis areas, but also to have feedback in real time from the end user. Uh, what I want to stress, since also uh, the, how the last question was, uh, the mobility, the municipality in, in this case is the sole owner of urban mobility data, which are collected and stored in the complete respect of the GDPR regulation. So now I'm going to move to show you a little bit more uh, some of the function. I'm not going to go into all the details, but some of the function that we have um, that we have developed together with the municipality of Florence. This is a very first view of the uh, the operating system, the web application. Um, here. Thanks to this map view, the operator has the possibility to see all the mobility services uh, in a single, from a single map. Of course, he, if the operator clicks on the poise, he can see all the details concerning that specific poise. This map does not only collect mobility services, strict to sensu, but also all those mobility events that can have an impact on the status of urban mobility, such as uh, car crashes or uh, municipal ordinances. And what I want to stress you, what is fundamental for uh, the, the public administration is that the status of these uh, events is monitored in real time. So they see if the status is changing or not. Uh, then 
from the operator's side, it is also possible, and it has been done for the municipality of Florence, to implement dashboards that provide a synthetic view of the data which are collected here in the in the in the figure you can see some of the data that are strictly related to uh, the, communi the um, uh, communication concerning uh, urban mobility within the territory of the city of Florence so all all the tweets that are collected in real time and um, analyzed and of course reported in a graphical forms to the uh, operator uh, then I want to move your attention to the mobile app. Uh, the mobile app is the core of the mobile app is the home page and the home page kind of summarizes all the information uh, concerning uh, the status of uh, the real time status of urban mobility within the city of Florence. Uh, so you have fundamentally an overview of all the mobility events that changes also according to the status of the mobility events. Uh, and it has the user here has all the um, personal information concerning his or her mobility uh, habits. And here in this little box that you see um, just next to the if logo, um, the end user has the possibility to provide to the public administration with feedbacks concerning uh, urban mobility. Uh, here is uh, exactly what, what I was uh, what I was telling you before. So this is the feedback section fundamentally, and what I want to stress to you is the fact that this feedback um, section is really oriented to create a communication channel between the end user and the public administrator. So from the mobile app, the end user can communicate directly with the uh, public administration, sharing his or her opinion concerning uh, some of the services that are that are provided. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the uh, public administration has the possibility to communicate directly with some kind, some uh, specific set of users or broadcasting uh, news to the whole uh, end user thanks to the news uh, section of uh, uh, the web application. Uh, then I'm, I want to I want to move my attention to another use case that we are currently developing. So this is really a, a growing creator, let's say. So we are working together um, with Wopcom GmbH in in the city of Wolfsburg, and in this case, using the same technology, but of course adapting that technology to a new use case, we are able to summarize the city in data. So for 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 the moment we. Have have a very first view of both the web application and the mobile the mobile application um, that uh, um, takes all the data and collects all the data from the city of Wolfsburg and provided it either to the operator or to the end user. Here in the picture you see, uh, as I told you, um, an overview of all the, the important data of the city of Wolfsburg. While here in these uh, two pictures, you see an overview of, let's say, let's say the end user's uh, um, mobile application. The principle is actually the same. People can go and check in real time uh, all the point, the, the point of interest that concerns waste management, mobility services, uh, all the static information, for example, concerning schools, museums, um, post office, and so on and so forth. And in in this case, the user can, uh, of course, store his or her information and uh, uh, store some specific point of interest uh, in um, in the in the favorite section to receive specific uh, and targeted push notification concerning that uh, point of interest. So that was it from my side. I basically showed you what's our experience both in the city of Florence and Forsberg for now. And if you have any kind of question, I'm here to answer. So thank you so much, uh, Benedetta, and uh, showing you, you also what you and uh, what is interesting also to see that the city of Wolfsburg. Um, because um, we started to discuss with them a couple of years ago, and there was different uh, different meetings and so on. And after, in this say, it was a three years uh, journey, and now you are implementing uh, a nice smart city platform. And I'm really happy to see that uh, 
the fruits are, are, are there. And this brings me also to the city of Vienna. The city of Vienna started uh, to collaborate with Fiverr already more than five years ago. It's uh, one of the platinum, no, I would say gold members um, with, a, with a clear understanding what Fiverr benef are the benefits. Um, uh, and uh, Brigitte is also on the board of directors of Fiverr. So there are a lot of links between the city of Vienna uh, in Austria again uh, and, um, and Fiverr. So I'm, I'm really happy to see that uh, Frank Scava is also uh, here today presenting the, the actual status of how smart is Vienna and uh, what are the, the actual situation and what you are looking for with the project and the outcomes of the smart data platform where my team was, was happy to support you uh, in the last years to, to bring this up. So it's up to you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, my name is Franz Xaver Pfaffenbichler. I have the pleasure to tell you a little bit about the smart mobility sector in Vienna. So going to the next slide. Yes, there it is. First, I want to talk briefly about the mobile environment in Vienna and the individual data that already exists. Then I will go into some applications that use this data and connect it for the citizen. Finally, I would like to share with you our thoughts on further developments in the area of mobility. There are many different ways in which people move from A to B in a city. With different means of transport, different routes can be used. Some are more in influenced by external, external factors, such as construction sites, than others. The guiding principle of the city of Vienna is to offer our citizens all possibilities. As you surely know, this is no easy task. Mass platforms are not only helping us to achieve this, but also the citizen to use the offer we have. There are 445 data records on the subject of traffic and transport on our data portal, data 40 203 of these are from the city of Vienna alone. Some examples are, of course, all public transport routes, stops and timetables, city bike stations, charging station for electric cars, construction sites that block streets or other routes, even LT2 services that determines the height, height profile between two given endpoints. But we also have some data sets that we cannot make public for different reasons. These are, for example, interfaces to Ubo and e-scooter providers. One very important data set is the openly available graph integration platform of Austria. The GIP forms the basis for the provision of high quality traffic data and it's, ex uh, it's exchanged between different organizations. It is the precondition for the nationwide provision of high quality traffic services and information in standardized form. The GIP provides authorities and public administration with an overview of the transport infrastructure based on a common data standard. One of the big examples using this data sets is Verkehrsaufkunft.at. I will talk about this example shortly. As a city, we have a lot of different data, which we now have to bring together and link in order to offer useful services. The Austrian Transport Information Service, VAO, is common information hub for the whole of Austria, covering all means of transport and covering all traffic events. It provides routing and other information content for most means of transport and numerous combinations, such as car routing, public transport routing, bicycle routing, bike and ride, park and ride, rental bikes, car sharing, etc. One application on this basis is A nach B, A to B. A to B, the mobile and multimodal traffic information service of the ITS Vienna region and the Verkehrsverbund Ost region will always find the best route for you through, throughout whole Austria, by public transport, bicycle on foot or by car, or well as the combination, inclusive bicycle transport and car trains. But routes are not only to get from A to B. Sometimes you want to walk a route just to be on the way. Leisure portals show walking routes, cycle routes, ski areas, and many other ways which one enjoys on vacation. 
the Wien bot is a service bot of the city of Vienna, which can meanwhile answer almost all questions about Vienna. The bot can even calculate, wo calculate routes and provide the essential information when you're on the go. It understands voice input in German and in English. Here are some examples of routing in national language, real-time data of the public transport, and geolocations of the nearest bike parking stations. At the end, I will give you a short outlook um, on our firewall urban data platform, smartdata.wien. We have already implemented two use cases for bike and car sharing in the Smarter Together project. The platform shows where the stations are located and how many bikes are still available. As the city of Vienna, we have planned many expansions, such as the integration of additional providers and the linking of various data sets. Information such as no driving zones or similar should also be displayed. We want to make this information available in two different ways, a public, public view for citizens and an internal view for our employees to better monitor all necessary guidelines in this field. I have to admit at this point, we are not very far in this area, area yet. Our focus is to evaluate possible expansions in 2021. For this purpose, we are in contact with many other cities and partners in Europe to exchange ideas. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, that's four hours now. Um, maybe now is uh, the possibility for quick questions now or later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Franz Klava, about this uh, how smart is, is Vienna. I just can uh, um, confirm that the VeeBot is, is really amazing. The, the VeeBot started a couple of years ago and evolved now. And uh, yeah. the answers you really get uh, in, I, I use this in German, of course, uh, it's, it's, it's really helpful and it's working very well. And, um, and this, this kind of interface to public data uh, is so convenient and, and so smooth. It's really amazing. And it's open source, right? So, uh, yeah. and, and this is uh, also uh, one of the things why we should recommend uh, to have a contact with you also on this case, because the VeenBot can be installed across Europe and across the world. And uh, as it already speaks That's English, right. and maybe also later on other, other implementations will have different other languages. Uh, it's, it's quite useful to, to have as an interface uh, to, to smart data in, in a city, right? So thank you for that. Thanks a lot. Um, the next, next speaker is uh, Detlef. Detlef from uh, Cleopa. Uh, it's an innovation company who are uh, investigating into IoT, data, uh, energy cases, mobility cases. And uh, um, there's a, a very nice team located uh, not only in, uh, in Henningsdorf, which is nearby Berlin, also across the world. Uh, you have uh, different advisors, consultants, project managers, and engineers who are working uh, on the different uh, uh, research projects and implementation projects. And uh, he's also the coordinator uh, of the Smart Mass pr uh, project uh, in the Smart Service World 2. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to have him here today just uh, as, uh, as a ninth speaker lineup here today uh, to give uh, his, uh, his views on, on Smart Mass and what he's doing. Uh, welcome, Detlef, it's your stage. Yes, hello, welcome from my side. Uh, I hope, oops. let me just see. So then I can tell you a little bit about uh, Cleopa and uh, the project which we are presenting here. It's the mass, it's smart mass use cases, challenges and opportunities in Corona times. So I'm always happy to be the coordinator of a grant project uh, of the smart mass project here funded by the German government, BMBE. And of course, have also very good and strong partners like uh, Fireware and uh, the Fraunhofer ESE and Regio IT from Aachen. I think some of you might know them also from different projects. And of course, the German DFKI, the Deutsche Forschungszentrum Künstliche Intelligenz. And um, we are uh, we are just just um, there to. Um, to develop like a new marketplace on the one hand, but also 
enable uh, new ways to to um, to to introduce new market players as well. And for this, we have I've heard the different presentations before from the cities of Vienna and also from the city of uh, Florence and in Wolfsburg. And uh, we have the use case of Hennigsdorf. Hennigsdorf is just a city very close to Berlin and um, has about uh, has a very high commuter uh, commuter rate of about uh, almost a third of the populations is commuting in and out uh, every day and so this is why why it is important to to have new solutions for those different uh, activities so um, of course as you can imagine the car traffic is uh, the best potential to save on traffic uh, size because usually you have uh, just one person about in a car so but the question is as always who wants to share the ride with another person apps for the other commuters poor commuters are already available and um, we have seen today a good variety of, of uh, proven solutions but still uh, larger cities have uh, other requirements than smaller cities and uh, more rural areas have other requirements again. So every, every project requires an individual solution and Henningsdorf decided, of course, it is important to have a Henningsdorf solution for that. And we are happy to, to work on that. So Henningsdorf, a great place to be. Um, I hope you have now the same slides as well. Yeah, next slide is uh, the one you you show. Right? Now we yeah, exactly. Henningsdorf is a great uh, a great place to be. So um, Henningsdorf is just a wonderful place to be. Just outside of uh, Berlin, it has a very very high quality of municipal services. So the city of Henningsdorf is supporting uh, new ideas, new technology, and new technologies, and adapting them, of course. And it's an attractive city of enterprises, as you can, can see from the fact that it has some of the highest per capita tax revenues in Brandenburg. And it's a home of Cleopal. Um, and um, so we just think it is a very good place to start with smart mass services. We did so. And in the end of February of this year, now I'm at the Mass Challenges and Opportunities page. End of February, and I think on February 28, we next had a presentation. Slide. Yes, next slide, please. Sorry. <laughs> so in the end of February, we had we had uh, already the presentation that we would start within the next few weeks our service in uh, Henningsdorf, and um, we found out yes there was a small uh, roadblock for that called Corona, which just made things not work as as many things worked over the year. But now we are still proceeding, and I want to tell you, of course, about the challenges and opportunities we had in this period. Of course, uh, there is restricted availability of partners, as you can tell in all your own projects as well, was, uh, uh, was, was a restriction for us and was a challenge for us. And if we talk to the municipalities or other cities and other stakeholders, the decision process became much more complex and hygienic restrictions in the traffic. This is the first thing we wanted to start on is like a ride sharing for the employees in within uh, Henningsdorf. And now, as you can tell, the hygienic restrictions say you need to have at least one and a half meter distance from the other person. So this might not work out. Opportunities, of course, the high open new openness to new projects with very fast impact. So easy low hanging fruits period i would uh, would call it and we as cleopa are just thinking just after the, the end of the project we are expecting quite a few projects to take off and we are discussing already with partners uh, some next ideas and then as you can tell also rather small and complex solutions are thought and uh, it's also the increased willingness to pay for impact something we had we did not expect in the pre-corona phase now in comparison with the post-corona phase or with the intermediate phase let's call it however it is so we as cleopa are now looking very positive into 2021 
I have a few slides here, but I think I'm at the end of the, my time, which uh, was given. And uh, so, of course, if you have some more questions, I'm also always happy. Now the last uh, slide. Thank you for joining us today. I say as uh, Detlef Ochevsky, I say as uh, Kleopa, and of course, I say thank you very much for joining us today as the uh, coordinator for the Smart Mars project here in Germany. Thank you. Thank you so much, Detlef, for these positive remarks at the end. Uh, thank you for all the speakers and also for the audience who have uh, was still excited to follow us and, and giving all the questions. And thank you all to having me as a moderator. And I hand over now to Christina and Ulrich for the closing remarks. We are right in time. And uh, thank you so far. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, um, Olaf, uh, for your moderation and uh, for guiding this uh, impressive uh, lineup of speakers through this program and staying in time. Uh, this is uh, not. Uh, usual for uh, our events and uh, thank you for all of you who listened to this event who joined our event and for me it was really uh, impressive to hear at the beginning from uh, the European Commission from uh, SVET uh, how they are defining the guidelines and which uh, financial support they are also bringing to um, the uh, area of uh, smart mobility and uh, smart mobility as a service and uh, one thing i remembered from uh, his speech connected standardized and interoperability as well as trustworthiness are the main enablers to uh, make smart mobility possible and then the uh, impressive speech uh, from uh, mario herger from the silicon valley um, showing us the disruptions which are really happening, especially uh, in the western part uh, of the US and also uh, in China. Um, and these disruptions are not coming from the traditional car manufacturers or bus manufacturers or mobility manufacturers. They are coming from the software people. And um, this uh, is a major change in using mobility but also it will have major effects on the producers of mobility means. Um, for example, the car manufacturers uh, where uh, it is said that uh, in uh, five years or more, they will lose one third of the employees, which is dramatic, I think. And uh, also from Bernard Peichel from uh, AVL List, uh, the approach of um, car as a new public-private partnership was uh, very interesting uh, for me and as well as from uh, Laura uh, talking about uh, smart mobility to improve the quality of life of the citizens and of the people who want to get from A to B and I think all dig digitization is around improving the quality of life of people who are using this um, the functionalities. Then we saw the uh, from Gernot and uh, also from Detlef what the project smart mobility as a service in Germany is providing as results and finally uh, several use cases from Vienna from Florence from Wolfsburg uh, which uh, impressively showed what's possible already so really an interesting two and a half hours on smart mobility as a service in our smart mobility domain day or future mobility domain day today and uh, christina what's going to come in the future <laughs> yeah thank you thank you Ulrich, and thanks to, to everybody for the great um for the great insights uh, i will also turn on my camera for a second uh, so it's a little bit more entertaining i hope <laughs> and uh yeah so let's have a look at to, to the slides, um, uh, what's upcoming. Um, you know that this is a series, we mentioned it in the very beginning, uh, a series of events. We have quite some of them of these, um, what they're called fiber days, they're domain specific, and um, we'll have 
we'll see in a second what uh, what's next on that because we're not closing the year only with uh, this event but already giving an insight into the next mobility day uh, in 2021 but um what you see also here is um we first uh, smart cities and mobility is part of that um is one of the um big um yeah big big territories and um also um, places where fiber sets a real sign in the market not only in germany or in europe but also globally meanwhile and um what we're doing is we're coming up very shortly with a book that shows all the great places so smart cities and smart mobility places where um open source with fiber has been successfully already implemented um, and very characteristic to open source um, we don't know exactly all the cities where we are involved we know many 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 of them but some um, have been um, fiber solutions implemented and we would love to learn from you if you have very close to where you are or around in your you know in your context and environment other places uh, where that you can just um, forward to us and make part of uh, that could make part of our future catalog and book. If you have so, don't hesitate. It just takes you very, very few minutes to get on the link that we have here uh, on the slide um, and make part of our city survey, smart city survey. Otherwise you just Google it, smart city survey, um, FIWAR, and um, you get easily into that. Um, on the next slide, um, you can see that we do really lots of uh, publications um, where you could um, get into with us also with regard to smart mobility and um, we're very proud to have many areas um, um, many different channels where we're active in and you can see that here from the tools on the left side up to um, areas like uh, Forbes or business managers and many many other press channels up to collaborative papers where we work on um, white papers together and launch them worldwide uh, we have a person basically more than one person that's helping us in this so when it's about press we have our press office and our uh, Valde Oliveira who helps us in doing that and when it comes to impact stories uh, some of them we put here in the chat the last one was around FOOPS that I um, posted here um, you can just um, yeah contact us and we can set up also a story together with you and now let's have a look on the next slide that shows you what's upcoming so fiber mobility day there is already a next one um whereas this one and the last one was very much around smart mass we will have the one in march uh, mid towards end march um, again around um, smart mass but even a wider focus uh, we have not completely um defined the date yet it will be between the 15th and the 25th and we'll be happy to contact you and let you know about then all the details i'm sure this will be before christmas that we can launch the dates and um, also one of the next ones um, in march uh, 25th is around blockchain for public services we believe for the audience of today this could be also a very nice um input and um, hint to uh, stay tuned and then sign up for this event um, we also and that's my very last message we go to lots of um, very important global events um, we bring our partners and members there um, you can do that with us if you are a member or want to become a member or you can obviously participate as a normal attendee and just listen what the world around fiber and open source has to say um, we have currently already started working on hannover Messe preparation and um, also on eVorld, which has been postponed from january to may of next year and just who's interested in that we're also coming towards the end with fidi fidi is uh, one of the biggest um, uh, events in smart destinations or intelligent destinations um, fiber was there a sponsor and um, we ran i think more than 10 slots around um, mobility smart city smart destination and tourism so also a topic that's very interested i think for most of the participants of today said that you can see there's a lot going on we hope to see you back uh, very very soon at least at least latest mid of march for the next mobility day and um 
until then, I want to thank you all. I want also thank you as a participant, but also our um, media partners that are today Smart Cities World, above all as a premium media partner, and obviously also business reporter, um, our future water and Zoom Global Smart Cities. Without those, we couldn't do all these great jobs and publish and promote all around the world. So thank you very much for your um, Attend, uh, attendance today of your support help also for the great speakers and their presentations today and um, not to forget uh, last but not least our fantastic moderator today um, to whom of course I will give the last word thank you bye bye